what's the plan? All right. So Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam Ala Rasulihi al-Kareem Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Amma ba'd Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala barakatuh I greet you all on this blessed day The best 10 days of the year um, Our session tonight inshallah will be approximately an hour um, I will start off 20-25 minutes inshallah Do a recap on the virtues of Hajj, the basic rituals, um, the activities that people are going to be starting, subhanAllah, from tomorrow. And today, Medina is almost a ghost town. Last few days, subhanAllah, it's been so busy. People have been coming from abroad, acclimatizing, getting ready. And then most of the people, they left yesterday and today. Because remember, the first day of Hajj, they must be in Mina on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah. Uh, which will be tomorrow. Um, okay, so this is, I'm going to go through some of this. I've got a combination of uh, slides that are from some of the training that I delivered about a month ago with the Ministry of Hajj uh, with uh, Umul Qura University in partnership with them in, in Mecca. And then also over the last few weeks, I've been trying to um, do a few sessions going through step by step the procedures for Hajj and Umrah because this year, Unfortunately, it's been a little bit chaotic. The new procedure for Westerners going to Hajj and Umrah, or Hajj in this case, and SubhanAllah, so a lot of people are needed a bit more guidance. Inshallah khair, well, everything is, is good. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we praise him, we send salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we are forever grateful for everything, every blessing um, that comes our way and every hardship that comes our way is a means of uh, removing our sins, purifying ourselves and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we look at the merits of Hajj. Again, there are only a, a few um, actions that allow a person to wipe out the whole history of all their bad deeds. One of them, of course, we know is once a person becomes a Muslim, any bad deeds they have done previously, um, they uh, get wiped out. So they become a, like a newborn. Another one is we know that if a person does hijrah sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once again, his or her sins. So if they move to a land where they want to get closer to Allah and practice a religion to protect their faith and their, and their offspring, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wipes out their, all their previous sins. And another one is Hajj. Once a person does Hajj to the best of their ability, uh, co completing all the rites and rituals, then uh, there is a hadith that mentions that a person goes back uh, as if uh, he or she was a newborn baby, meaning all of their previous sins are wiped out. So you can see the virtue of Hajj. And also, subhanAllah, uh, the, um, the Umrah, of course, from one Umrah to another, wipes out the sins, the minor sins. Um, and Hajj also, as per the hadith here of Abu Huraira, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, an umrah is an expiation for his sins committed between it and the next, but an accepted Hajj will receive no less reward than paradise. Um, SubhanAllah, look at this, the reward of doing a Hajj that is accepted to Allah um, is no less than paradise. And now look at this, that there's a man, and it's probably going around on social media. I just send it to many of you on my broadcast list. SubhanAllah. An elderly gentleman, 60 plus, from one of the African countries. And he was in Hajj. And then someone asked him, you know, uh, how did you get here? And he said he sold his house. He said, well, why did you do that? He says, I, I wanted to come to Mecca to see the mercy of Allah, to do Hajj. Imagine that. The man is his 60 plus. Um, his wife has passed away and he doesn't have any children. And subhanAllah sold his house, gave it up because he wanted the mercy of Allah, the love of Allah to just for this action. So this is something fascinating. Abu Huraira, the other hadith we have here, the Prophet Sallallahu mentions, Abu Huraira mentions the hadith. Um, Prophet Sallallahu was asked, which is the best deed, Ya Rasulullah? Prophet Sallallahu replied, to believe in Allah and his messenger. He was asked again, which is the next best? 
He said to participate in jihad in Allah's cause. And we know jihad is very a heavy duty. It may end up a person sacrificing their life. Then he asked again, what is next, Ya Rasulullah? And the Prophet ﷺ replied to perform Hajj Mabrur, Mabrur and accepted Hajj. So imagine, look at the scale of things in deeds. Um, to believe in Allah, of course, to be a Muslim, a Mu'min, and then to participate in jihad, and then Hajj on the top ranking of good deeds. And that's why some people, they save for 30 years, and like that man, he sold the, his whole house, and he gave it up to come to seek the pleasure of Allah. Now, what is Hajj Mabrur? Hajj Mabrur is what everyone, inshallah, we pray, those who have gone this year, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes their Hajj Mabrur uh, an acceptable, a high quality. A Hajj which is free from sins, full of obedience to Allah. So there's no point of going to Hajj and then people are still sometimes smoking, uh, backbiting, uh, watching uh, maybe Netflix and things like that. SubhanAllah, no. Performing it for Allah's sake with no hypocrisy. Remember, Hajj is between you and Allah. It's not about your wife, husband, your children. Forget everyone. Okay, It's a selfish act. It's your relationship. And Sheikh Muhammad will go into that, how we develop this inner uh, spirituality and a link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's about you and Allah. Um, performing the pillage and obligations. So there are certain acts we're going to look at. If you don't do them, the Hajj will be uh, will not be accepted. Batil. And there are other acts that are very important. If you miss them, you can put an expiation, meaning you can do a uh, a slaughter to cover for this missing action. We'll go through that in a in a in a minute, inshallah. Where are we? Right. Uh, preparation. So many of our brothers and sisters have done this. And this is important for all of us. Um, sincerity, that this is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, hold on, just, just want to check that. It's, yep, it's recording. Just had a bit of a flashback, so maybe it's not recording. Yep. Um, sincerity, repentance from all the previous sins that we have um, to wipe out our previous sin. Ask Allah for forgiveness when we go there to clean up. Settle any disputes that we have with relatives. Ask forgiveness from those people all of our friends and family, preparing your will, giving any outstanding uh, payments that you owe, choosing good companionship. Well, this year it's a bit difficult because of the lottery system. You might not go with the people that you wish to go with, but inshallah, you make with those who have gone, they'll make new friends. Uh, very important, the expense for Hajj. Many people forget this. So if you're a nightclub owner or um, uh, you've won the lottery recently and you want to go to Hajj, well, Let's be honest, it's a waste of time. You're just going to go through the motions and the hardship, and it's not going to be accepted because the Hajj has to be from an income that is pure and lawful. Learning about the Hajj and Umrah, and this year, subhanAllah, the responsibility has gone more on the individuals because they're not really going in groups from the West. Before you used to have a sheikh or a scholar or an imam, a Hajj guide will help you step by step. This year, everybody's doing, has to ramp up and learn the rites and rituals by themselves. And the next important point, of course, is the memorization of du'as, supplications, and Quranic uh, verses, which is also important. What can you take with you? Number one, the chief quality that you need is patience. And let me tell you what happened yesterday. We have a group, uh, Brits and some friends from Blackburn. Um, they were sitting in the coach in Medina, and I'm not saying whether, you know, I'm not justifying to say whether it's, uh, you know, it's good, bad, or ugly, but I'm saying that the level of patience needed. So outside the hotel, they waited about four to five hours in the coach. Normally, in that time, you'd, you could get to Mecca. In a normal day, you could drive from here, from my house, and you could end up in Mecca in less than five hours, four and a half, five hours. Okay. And then once they're getting near Mecca, it's gridlock. So, it took them about 15 hours. Imagine that. 15, yes, 15 hours. I'm sure they've taken some breaks for toilet breaks, loo breaks, and salah. But imagine, so the journey is already starting. Backache, whatever it may be, holding in your, um, maybe you're tired. Some people got foot ache, foot swollen, headache, backache. Okay, you need lots of patience. Ask a lot for patience. Not to get angry, things will happen. Um, uh, people might bump into you, uh, ram wheelchairs into you, lots of, you know, uh, unintended things. 
Number four, don't worry about what others are doing. Your greatest concern is, is Allah going to accept it from you or not? It's Allah. It's about Allah. Is Allah going to be happy with me? Am I trying my best? Am I giving 100%? Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time for istiqamah, for steadfastness. Okay, and also ask for Allah's help at every step of the way for Allah to make it easy. General good habits. I'm going to quickly go through some habits. Du'as. When you are the hujjaj, when you're out and about, they should be doing lots of du'as. Okay, traveling du'a, bus, house, building, uh, when they're doing the ablution, salah, lowering the gaze, very important. When you have food, du'as, maximize the time and don't mix with uh, people that you shouldn't be mixing with, non-mahram people. So quick recap, um, those who probably already been, um, umrah. What are the pillars? What are the obligations of an umrah? So, Because remember, some of the people are doing hajj. I'm going to go through it in a minute quickly. There are three types of hajj um, that people can do. And two of them involves umrah within it. So what are the four parts of the umrah? Ihram, you have to put on the clothing for the men or make sure the intention to be ready. That's number one. Tawaf, number two. Number three, the psa'i, safa and marwa. And number four, cutting the hair. Okay, these are, um, without these four, you won't, your umrah will not be complete. If the first three are left out, then you have to repeat the uh, umrah again. The fourth one, the shaving or shortening the hair, if you do happen to forget that, let's say, which is quite unlikely, you can uh, make up for that by giving a, a sacrifice. Now, let's move on regarding the other important point is the miqat, the entry points, where you have to put your ihram and get ready, <clears throat> get ready um, to do the talbiyah and get in the mood and in the intention. So there are different entry points. For example, from Medina, we have a place called Dhul Halaifa, about 15, 20 minutes, Masjid Miqat, uh, 10, 15 minutes from where I am now. You go there, uh, you can uh, put the ihram on, you can do it from your house as well, from Medina, um, and make your intention and you're ready now. Once you pass that zone, you're kind of in the zone ready to do Hajj. A lot of people flying from England, Usually they do it in a plane before they get to Jeddah because Jeddah is itself in the Miqat. And uh, people, if you're coming from Yemen, there will be Yalamlam. So there are different um, entry points. Uh, if you're coming from Australia, depending on where you're coming, if you're landing in Jeddah, you'll have to do your ihram on the plane. Important part of the Hajj process, the ihram. Uh, this is the men's ihram, the two white clothes. Uh, for the women, it's uh, normal clothing without kind of... Uh, Decoration, pizzazz, and two bright, distracting colors. Um, shouldn't doesn't it shouldn't be white because it will resemble the men. Now, <clears throat> tawaf. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Sa'i also. <clears throat> now, the kinds of Hajj. This is important for those who gone, not going, going. There are three types. So if you look from the uh, on your my screen here on the right to left. There are um, the tamatu, which is the most common with the Prophet used to do. Um, you do an umrah. So people leaving from Medina, for example, yesterday, they put their ihram on, they made the niyyah for uh, umrah. So they would have gone to Mecca, <coughs> do the uh, tawaf, do the sa'i, safa marwa, cut the hair. Okay, they would have done umrah, done. Then tomorrow, Tomorrow they will put a new ihram on for hajj and make a new niyyah. Okay, and with this one, they have to do a sacrifice. All right, so this is like um, you do umrah separately, then you follow it by hajj, and this is called the tamatu uh, hajj. Type number two is you do it with one intention. Uh, they're both kind of merged, combined, because there's one intention, one ihram, and you do the same, the rites and rituals, um, the, what do you call it, the sa'i, the tawaf, uh, and then you offer the sacrifice. Okay, this is called qiran. Number three, slightly easier one, uh, in some sense. You don't have to, because the Prophet did say some of the companions, when they came to do hajj, they never bought the sacrificial animal with them, or they couldn't afford to have an animal to sacrifice. So for those type of people, you have to do an ifrad, meaning you don't sacrifice and you don't do umrah 
you just do a pure Hajj. You do the rituals of Hajj, which we're going to go through in a minute. Okay, so three types. Now, um, we'll kind of whiz through it, but this is the itinerary for everyone. Okay, from tomorrow, uh, this is what they're all going to be doing. The 8th of Dhul Hijjah is tomorrow. They will go. Some people, they said they start traveling tonight. Okay, going to Mina. Some will go, most likely, most will go after Fajr tomorrow, 8th of Dhul Hijjah. And they'll stay in Mina. Then day nine, which is our Friday, which is the heavy day, the day of Arafah. Will they be there in the dua? We should be fasting, but the Hujjaj are not allowed to fast. They will be normal. Uh, day nine, they will be in Muzdalifah. Day 10, they will be doing um, the rituals of Hajj, throwing the pebbles, slaughtering, shaving the hair, uh, the Tawaf al Ifada, Asai. And then you've got day 11, 12, and 13 of the Hijjah, the uh, throwing of the pebbles at Mina. So, what are the days of Hajj? In general, look, it's about five days. You can do it in five day eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. There is a catch. If you don't leave Mina before Maghrib on the 12th day, after completing everything, then you have to stay uh, one more day and repeat day 12, the, the seven stoning, which we're going to have a look at. So the worst case will be six days, um, unless the other situation is if uh, for the ladies, where they might have to stay back, because if they're on their uh, cycle, then they're not allowed to do the tawaf. And they have to do that once they come out of their cycle. So the different uh, intentions, labbaik Allahumma umrah, labbaik Allahumma hajjan, depending on the type uh, you choose, labbaik Allahumma hajjan. So on the eighth day, pretty much everybody will, unless the ones for uh, ifrad, they put it on before, or qiran, but the, those who do in tamattu uh, will make their intention and they will do it on the eighth. Um, everybody will be starting their rituals on the 8th of uh, Dhul Hijjah, which is tomorrow, and they will recite the Talbiyah frequently, okay? Labbaik Allahumma labbaik labbaik la sharika lak labbaik inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. So what do they do on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah? So that's day one and that's tomorrow. So these are the next five minutes or so. I'm going to just go talk you through the five days, the rituals of Hajj. So day one, which is tomorrow, the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, they're going to be at <coughs> Mina. Most likely after Fajr, most people will go there. Um, some are going tonight, I heard. Uh, whichever way, you pray your five prayers on time. You don't combine. Normally as a traveler, you combine. But they're shortened. Fajr is normal. Dhuhr is two. Asr is two. Maghrib is three. Isha is two. Okay? And that's a very soft start. There's nothing else to do in Mina that day. Make dua, get ready psychologically, uh, pour out your heart, think, contemplate over your sins, mistakes. It's just a, a day where you shorten your prayers, lots of dua. Then after Fajr, from the Sunnah, to leave after Fajr, uh, to go to start your activities on day nine, which is Arafah, the big one. Okay, Dhul Hijjah, the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, which is day two, Arafah. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said in many different hadith, Hajj is Arafah. So what's going to happen? They arrive at Arafah and the, the Hajjaj now are commanded to combine from the Sunnah. They need to combine the prayer, Zuhr and Asr, Zuhr and Asr prayer, two plus two, one adhan, two iqamas, okay, two and two rakah. The Sunnahs, if you want to pray, you can. Um, prayers, oh, excuse me, I need the charger, please. Laptop charger is very low. Um, quickly to make lots of dua it's in your son's room lots of duas and then leave at Maghrib so again this is a rule uh, that they must leave without praying sorry sound uh, trying to get the volume down the light the, yep apologies for that so the, the from the uh, rituals of Hajj without praying on that day of 9th on Arafah to leave at Maghrib because they will pray uh, Maghrib and Isha at Muzdalifa. Sorry about that. It's just technology. I'm not being prepared. Bismillah, I think. All right. 
One second. Yeah, okay, great. Apologies for that. Back to the screen, right. Okay, so that's what they have to do. The Hajjaj must leave um, at Maghrib and arrive on at Muzdalifa, and they pray Isha, Maghrib and Isha, as soon as they arrive, combined. The prayers are shortened. And then what happens, so this is now uh, getting into uh, day three. Okay, so the prayers are shortened. This is the 10th of the Hijjah. Um, and remember those uh, at home on day two, the Arafah day, we should be fasting. All of us should be fasting, getting the rewards. But those on Hajj do not fast. So now the prayers are shortened. They finish Isha and Maghrib. They sleep outdoors. They collect seven stones. Okay, seven stones. Only they go, they pray Fajr. They wait until sunrise at Doha. Then they go and stone the Jamarat Aqaba, only the big shaitan. Okay, then they do their sacrifice or if their group has arranged it, they wait for the news of the sacrifice to finish. Then they will perform the tawaf in Mecca. They will go back to Mecca, the tawaf of Hajj. Then they will perform the sa'i. Okay, then they will trim and cut their hair. So now what would happen is they will come out of all of the restrictions of ihram, except they cannot have uh, it's still in minor ihram, no relations with their spouse. But uh, other than that, where you know cutting nails, um, perfume, you can do all that. Now after these, after the day three of Muzdalifa are done, then you go on to day four, which is the eleventh of the Hijjah. They will go to, they will stay in Mina and they will go to the Jamarat, where there are the three shaitan, the symbolic places, uh, where you know when Ibrahim al -Salam was going to sacrifice his son Ismail. And the shaitan would come and whisper and say, don't do this, don't do this, this is cruel, this is evil. And Ibrahim Sam will shoo away the shaitan. So um, on day 11, what do you have to do? They have to take tw 21 stones uh, from where they are, Muzdalifa, or wherever they are, doesn't matter. Um, and each shaitan, you say, Allahu Akbar, and throw seven times. After the small shaitan is finished, make dua. After this, go second one, the medium, seven times, make dua. After the third one, you throw the big shaitan seven times, no dua, you return back to Mina. Then you repeat the same. Yeah, you repeat uh, the same on day five, the 12th of the Hijjah. You go to Jamarat, your seven stones, uh, at the small one, dua, medium one, dua, big one, after that, no dua. Then you leave Mina before Maghrib. So this is the condition now. You must leave uh, before Maghrib, go to Mecca, and to perform the tawaf al wida, the, um, the leaving tawaf. And once this is done, that's it now. You are uh, free of all obligations. The full um, uh, uh, ihram is out and the hajj is complete. Okay, now if you... Because of the queue, if some people are tired, they couldn't do, um, you know, they wanted to, they didn't finish the stoning by Maghrib and it's gone over Maghrib and Teresha, then you must stay in Mina another night, the 13th of the Hijjah. So this is now day six. And then what do you do? So repeat the day from day five, stoning three, the all the Jamarat seven times, dua after small, dua after medium, no dua after the, the large, you go back to Makkah, do the the farewell tawaf, and then your hajj is complete. So for some people, if they don't, for help, whatever reason, they can end up finishing. And that's, so that's your five slash six days of hajj. Now, let's quickly just go through the pillars in the sense that if you miss any of these, meaning you didn't put the haram on, you didn't make your intention, unfortunately, your, your hajj, you'll have to come back again next year. If you don't go to Arafah, and do the du'as. So on the day of Arafah, you are in Muzdalifa, you are in Muzdalifa, in Makkah, you know, uh, that's it. This is a pillar. It's like a house, you know, the house, the pillars of the house. If the pillars break, uh, then the whole house crushes. Same here, the hajj will crush, meaning there will be no hajj for you. If you don't do the tawaf al father, the main tawaf and the sa'i, that is part of the hajj, if you don't do them, there is no hajj. You'll have to repeat your hajj again. There's no way to make these up. These here, however, though, these six, 
spending a night in Muzdalifa, uh, staying overnight in Mina on the days of stoning, stoning the devil, shaving and trimming the hair, doing the sacrifice, the farewell tawaf. Now, farewell tawaf, according to the Malikis, you don't even, it's sunnah, you don't need to do it. According to other madhabs, you must do it. Now, what happens if you miss out one of these? Yeah, you're not able to do. Well, here you have a chance. You can do a sacrifice to cover for any of these six that are missed out. So these are what called the obligations, the wajib of the hajj. Okay, you can cover for these. But the other four I mentioned, if you miss any of this amount, game over. It's not going to happen. Now, while in the state of Ihram, remember we said there is Ihram. When you go into this Ihram, you come into a bit of a special spiritual state. You're wearing the garments. You cannot, men cannot cover the head. The women can't cover something that's draping stuck to their face. They can have something maybe like that, but anything touching and covering their face, not allowed. You're not allowed in a state of ihram. Um, women not allowed to wear gloves. Uh, no one is allowed to perfume, put any uh, perfume on. From the, the way of the Prophet ﷺ, before putting the ihram on, Aisha radiallahu anha used to put perfume on uh, the Prophet ﷺ. So you can put perfume on your body, before you put the ihram on. After that, no more perfume for the men. For the women, of course, no perfume. Cutting the hairs, trimming the nails, none of that while you're in a state of ihram, no hunting. I think no one's going to be doing that. No uh, doing any marriage contracts. And of course, the other one we mentioned about intimacy between husband and wife. This is also not allowed in a state of ihram. Quickly, last two minutes while I'm going to hand it over. I've taken up exactly kind of my half. This is the layout of the, uh, the Kaaba. With the, the this is the door, the multazim, the black stone, Safan Marwa is here, the Maqam Ibrahim, um, the Rukhan Shami, all the different layouts. Let's have another little look, aerial view. You start off here, okay, where the black stone is, you start your toe off this way, so it's anti clockwise, yeah. And uh, Safan Marwa is that way also, uh, yep. You got another pictorial uh, aerial view here. Those, and then you have to do seven times, huh? Tawaf. And Sa'i also, where are we? Sa'i is also one, each one. Safa to Marwa is one, Marwa to Safa is two, and you do seven. The Jamarat now is very advanced. It looks like this. Yeah, there's all these ramps and like uh, modern car parks. And then this is what they look like. The big Aqaba or Qubra. This is what you do on the first, uh, the second day of Hajj. And then you, on the other days, of stoning, um, 11, 12, day 11, 12, and 13, possibly, you do small, medium, large, small, medium, large. All right, that, that's your kind of nutshell of the activities, rituals of Hajj, inshallah. I hope um, this has given you a, it's a very quick, a very speedy, uh, last time with the ministry, we spent like kind of three days on the whole thing. Other times I'm doing two hours. Inshallah, it was a very quick summary walk you through what the Hajjaj are going to go through, inshallah. And what it, well, those who've done it, you know it. And those who, inshallah, make intention uh, to do it in the future, as may Allah accept it from you. I'll hand over to Sheikh Muhammad for the next half an hour to go and look at some of these rituals that I mentioned to you. They're quite dry. Uh, they're kind of, you know, quite physical. But what about the spiritual dimension? You know, what, what does it involve and how does it relate? Because the whole session is focusing, looking at the spiritual inner dimensions of Hajj. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed, please go ahead and take the floor. The floor is yours. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Rasulullah. Salatu wa salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah uh, khay to uh, Sheikh uh, for that. Alhamdulillah. In depth uh, look there at the rights of um, Hajj. So there is the spiritual aspect as as well. We have to fulfil. Uh, all the obligations, uh, as the as Sheikh Yusuf said, but there's the spiritual side uh, as well. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, That I have not created jinn and mankind except to worship me. And if you look at the five pillars, you start with the kalima la ilaha illallah, and then we go to our five times salah. We go to our psalm. We go to our zakat and we go to hajj. Every aspect of the five pillars, which is the foundations of al-Islam, every aspect, there is a connection with tazkiyah of 
purification. So when we embrace Islam, we are reverting back, we are converting back, we are returning to the natural fitra. There we are cleansing ourselves, we are purifying ourselves, and we are returning. And in our five times, and so that is in essence, la ilaha illallah. And when we are doing our five times salah, then when we are raising our hands, that the spiritual aspect that we're just pushing back the dunya to reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, the salah is not accepted unless we are purified with wudu. And then there's the element of soul, of fasting, of the cleansing, of the reconnecting with the Quran, uh, abstaining from the food, the cleansing away from all of the aspects of the dunya. And then there's the zakat and the clear connection there with taskir nafs. And then there's the hajj. Alhamdulillah, the hajj is about cleansing. It is about purifying. And inshallah ta'ala, we know that there are brothers and sisters that do do hajj. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the tawfiq of sustenance, but it's only an obligation, if we can, uh, to make hajj once. And to go on to this wonderful journey. And what we are reenacting, inshallah ta'ala, is the life of Ibrahim, alayhi salam and his family with the construction of the Kaaba. This journey that we learn about in the Maktab, we learn about in Madrasa, we learn about through Islamic studies. <clears throat> and so when we focus on the life of Ibrahim salam, this is the essence of Tawheed, the love, the deep love and affection that Ibrahim salam, had for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Labayk Allahumma labayk. That whatever you command, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will obey. And we see there in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that throughout those tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put on Ibrahim alayhi sallam, he was obedient throughout. And he succeeded in these tests. So this wonderful uh, understanding of the love, of the obedience, of the submission that Ibrahim salam had towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learn again in the life of Ibrahim salam how he destroyed the idols, his relationship with his father, and then his journey to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his son or sons as well and his wife and the connection there with the Zamzam and the connection here with the Zamzam of purification as well and there's the health elements, the health benefits there in Zamzam. And then we compare it to the love that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa also had of course with Allah subhanahu Wata'ala, because the first ayat revealed to the Prophet وسلم, in the cave of Hira was that the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, was then the last chosen Prophet to deliver the message of Al Islam to bring to return everyone to the authentic path. And of course, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, his deep love for Mecca and the Kaaba. And what is interesting is, uh, alhamdulillah, that uh, in, um, so in, in one of the uh, surahs in Surah Shura, uh, 42 verse 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the mother of the towns, which is Mecca, Ummah, uh, refers to the mother of the uh, towns. And when we look, as Sheikh has just mentioned, all the, the key aspects, the key areas connected with Hajj. So we've got Arafah, Mina, Safa, Mawa. Uh, these, th these terms from the Islamic perspective are feminine terms. So when we look at it like this, 
It is as if we are returning to the navel of the mother's womb. We are returning to the center. We are returning to the mother, to, to Mecca, as we see here in the Quran. These are feminine names. And so it's this return, this, this, this return. And if Allah subhanahu wa gives us the sustenance, then we should use it to make that return, to, re, to return to the center, to that navel. And that's where those of us that have done the Hajj and those that are going to experience Hajj, in, inshallah, that they will feel this sense of, of returning. They will feel a sense of deep love, of contentment, of happiness, of, of calm. And that's what it, we feel <clears throat> when we've been away from, our, from our, our mother and we return to the warmth and to the love of our mother. SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah. And again, when we go for the men, when we go into this ihram, it is, we're not competing on the, the designer clothes. We're just going back basically to how we came into this world naked and just with a piece of cloth and also is connecting us for when we depart in this world as well we wear two pieces of cloth and in the same way when we go into the ground as well so it is a returning as I said to you, we are returned to the center. We are returning to, to the, the navel of the mother. And we're going back there just how in the dunya or in the worldly life we came out of a mother. And that's how we will then return back into the earth. So already as we prepare for Hajj, we begin to see there's a deep connection of love connecting all of the, the five pillars of Al-Islam. And when we look at the soul, al-asr, al insan That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us one short surah, and Imam Shafi'i, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him, said if there's one surah that you'd only need is this particular surah. And we also learn that the companions of the Prophet وسلم, would not depart unless one of them had recited this surah that we can see today in the dunya that time is moving very fast. And without doubt, we are in the end of times. And this is given to us, this is revealed to us by and, and taught to, to us by the Prophet We are in the end of times and time will move fast. And the only hope is that those who believe and who have sabr and it's a deep subject to go into tafsir, the, the deep understanding of that particular surah. But alhamdulillah, this is a, a deep reflection, tafakku, because when we look at the dunya time, it's moving forward. Many of the ulama say, what we must do is to return, is to move the, into the opposite direction. The masses are going into the cities. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us that he will destroy every city before Qiyam. So what we must do is go in the opposite direction against the modern aspect of time, which is going clockwise. And the Sheikh mentioned that when we do Tawaf, it's anti-clockwise. And many of the ulama focus on this and, and they go through this in deep uh, contemplation. And Alhamdulillah, uh, Dr. Abdullah Al-Musla from the committee for the study of the scientific miraculous nature of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, mentions again that through study, uh, and you may have seen it, that the pigeons and the birds that are resident around Mecca, around the Haram, they do not fly over. They fly around. Often they will fly Anti, anti-clockwise. So why are we going anti-clockwise when our life and our time is going clockwise? And many of the older must say then we must reflect and have deep to fuckle on what's happening within our own selves. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues throughout the Quran commands us to reflect, ponder on the macro, the universal signs, the ayah, as well as those signs, the macro, the micro, which are in, in us. What is in the macro is also in the micro. And if we just look at what's happening inside us, just look at the heart, look at the blood system, the circulation system, the blood begins to circulate in an anti-clockwise direction. If we look, and science has shown us now, and it's also here by the Committee of the Scientific Miraculous Nature of the Quran and the Sunnah, or the Prophet peace and blessings be upon him, that even the atoms, even the, the atoms, they and the nuclei, and, and the, it's all moving in that anti-clockwise direction. All this is taking place within our own body. Everything is going anti-clockwise. So even those who are not Muslim, they are also doing tawaf. Subhanallah. Then we go macro, from macro, from micro to macro. We study the sun, we look at the moon, we look at the earth, we look at um, basically uh, Everything in the galaxy, in the planets, are going anti-clockwise. If we study eco-literacy, we study the language of nature, and we see again that everything is moving anti-clockwise. So what we are doing, when we perform Hajj, when we perform Tawaf, we are moving in harmony with the last of Pana, to Allah's creation. And when you talk to brothers and sisters who are known as the Hajj, Hajji, how did you feel when you were doing Tawaf? They all say, I felt contentment, I felt calm, I felt at peace. Because what is, is shown here is that we are in coherence, we are in tune with the last of Pana. To Allah's universal system, this divine order. And so, as we go in anti clockwise, we move in the direction of the Waf anti clockwise. We are moving in the same direction as the angels above, as we learn. And all of creation is going anti clockwise, including the birds and the pigeons there as, as well. So, we are reconnecting we are returning to the future we are we are retuning ourselves and as i said that the shape of the atom uh, is the shape of the uh, galaxy subhanallah and again dr abdullah masla in the committee they've also looked at safwa and mawa and many of the the ulama of saying likewise we have the magnetic poles of the North Pole and the South Pole. Likewise, there are ulama now in this committee that have said that there is a, man, a, a magnetic charge between uh, Safwa and Mawa. And so what happens is, and likewise, when we do into Af, because we, we also learn that research has shown that it is in the center and even astronauts who have gone into space have, have and, and it's been recorded that they have seen illuminated light come up out of the earth and go continually into space. And when they checked and they recorded, the data proved that it came from the Kaaba, subhanAllah. And so when we are doing Tawaf, we are being recharged because we are energy beings. We are energy beings. We have the electromagnetic current, energy field around the earth coming from the sun, and we are part of it as well. Hence, we have the, the heart with the ECG, we have the, the brain with the EEG. And so this inner dimension is that we are, when we are, uh, we are connecting to the Kaaba, when we see the Kaaba for the first time, the whole life of the, the, the life of the Prophet, peace and lessons upon him, comes back into us that we've studied in the Quran, the Sunnah, the Sirah of the Prophet, and the life of Ibrahim, 
So this deep love that once we just gaze at the karma, and then we begin that tawaf, which is cleansing us, which is connecting us. And don't forget, as we go in anti-clockwise, the heart, the qalb, the qalb is in direct line of a kab. If we was going in the opposite direction, then it wouldn't be, subhanallah. So the heart is, is in line, it's in line with the Kaaba. This is why many, many, if not all brothers and sisters say, I felt contentment, I felt uh, peace, I felt in, in total, in total harmony. So they're being charged, they're being charged as they go around and they complete the seven circuit. And then they go, and they take Zamzam, further purification. And then they go between Safwa and Mawa. And again, according to many of the ulama, is that there is some uh, magnetic charge there to even boost them. So we've gone in our lifetime. If we have the sustenance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this ability to go to connect with the Kaaba, to do ta'af, to do, to do hajj, to be spiritually charged to be charged to, to to have that reconnection with the whole of the universe which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran the whole of the universe is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the whole year we have been submerged into the dunya surrounded by all of the impurities and now we have a chance of cleansing ourselves of coming as the Sheikh uses so as coming within that zone and connecting ourselves to those rings which are around the Kaaba. And the closer we get, and we can see again, as you join any, as you join to go around Tawaf, you can see that it starts in the center and it goes out and it goes out into a spiral shape. Natural patterns again that we can learn by observing the natural world. And the, the rings go out and out and out and out. But we know the further that we go out, then when we leave, then there's the problem of this spiritual disconnection. And so we leave the Tawaf, we take the Zamzam, and then we go between Safa and Mawa for that final sort of a charge of energy. And then we, we carry on and then we return after Mina, after Arafat, and then we return back to our homes. But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still commanding us to make that daily connection, that alignment with our hearts in the direction of the Qibla, with the five times prayer which is strategically uh, placed. So these are deep spiritual um, uh, lessons that many of the ulama, they uh, teach us. Uh, of course, we, 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 we all learn about the life of the, of the Prophet, peace and blessed be upon him. He was born in Mecca, and then he had to flee Mecca to go to Medina, where the Sheikh Yusuf is but he's earning to then go back to Mecca. He went back to Mecca, cleansed it, destroyed the idols, just like with uh, the Prophet Ibrahim, salam, to establish the system there, to cleanse it, and for the, the future generations, including us and inshallah ta'ala, our children, then to go there and to do this journey of, of Hajj, which is one of the, the pillars of al-Islam. And so it, it shows us that when we return to the first ayat revealed to the Prophet that the Prophet, peace and blessing upon him, could not read or write. And this is what he was saying to the angel Jibra alayhi salam. It was at this point that the wahi, the revelation came down and through his contemplation in the cave of Hira, to the ayah of the Quran, to the Al-Quran of Taqwini, the book of nature, that now, as the ulama say, it was now a message to the Prophet, O Prophet of Allah, connect 
the whole of the ayat of the natural world, which is a book that has to be read. Connect that now to the wahi and deliver that message of, of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the whole of mankind. And so to e extend our understanding of Hajj, that we have the rituals, we have the fiqh aspects, which Sheikh was just going through, but there's a deeper understanding as well. And subhanAllah, we can only learn this and continue to learn this by being in the company of the ulama. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kunu remain in the company of the ulama. Because when we look at the, the term fiqh, there is the fiqh of the jurisprudence, there's the fiqh of hajj, the fiqh of som, the, the fiqh of, of uh, uh, zakat, and it's there, it has its place, but from the Quranic uh, perspective, the term fiqh has a much more wider, deeper uh, understanding, which, mean, which means to understand. So in Shalatara, we, we pray for the brothers and sisters that are due uh, from tonight to, to begin this wonderful spiritual journey that they fulfill the, 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 the rites, the rituals, uh, but they do have this spiritual uh, journey as, as, as well, and living out the life of the Prophet Ibrahim al-Islam, living out the life of, of uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they're having this deep connection with Mecca, with Arafat, with Mina, they are returning to the navel of of the womb, and inshallah ta'ala, they are cleansed, and inshallah ta'ala, then they will then go back as newborn children and continue their life. And inshallah ta'ala, that la ilaha illallah will be even more stronger because now it will be deep into the heart. And they will be reminded of this journey that they've undertook five times a day in their salah by having this daily connection in alignment with the Qibla. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. Jazakallah khair, may Allah bless you. Uh, I hope that this has given everyone a bit of an insight into the importance of Hajj, um, the outer and the inner dimensions. And we are, of course, in the best 10 days. So please do continue to make dua for us, for the Muslim Ummah. And you know that, inshallah, that all of us grow in these uh, best 10 days of the year. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us more good health to continue to worship him. All right, guys, everyone, may Allah bless you. And thank you, Sheikh Muhammad. And we'll see everyone soon for another uh, session soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.